name is Lou. I'm the program manager at Boston Birth and Family. Um, for those of you who haven't encountered us at Blossom yet or know who we are, we're an independent community-based nonprofit. Um, and our mission is to connect new and expected families with services, resources, and support for a healthy, informed, and confident pregnancy and parenthood. Um, so we make this possible uh, with one full-time executive director and eight part-time uh, staff, including myself. Um, and the programs we offer at Blossom are brought to us by 35 independent contractors that specialize in that field that they bring to you. Um, so we are or we're supported by sponsorships, grants, and individual donations. Um, so we kind of create this, this community, this blossoming community for you. Um, if you feel inspired by today's content, we've included a link for our network for good in your Zoom chat. So you guys can check that out. Um, anything helps and we're so grateful to be here serving our community. Um, so as I mentioned about the Q&A, if you guys have any questions about today's content, feel welcome to post your question there. Um, if it doesn't get addressed during the presentation, we'll address it at the very end. Um, everyone will be muted aside from these panelists and myself uh, for the duration of the, of the uh, segment. And um, this is being recorded, um, so if you would prefer to protect your identity when you submit a chat, there's an option of selecting anonymous so your name isn't read out. Um, and additionally, if we have someone interrupt our segment, if we get Zoomed bomb, which I'm not anticipating at all, um, we'll close it there and we'll email out a, um, a recording of today's presentation for you at a, or possibly reschedule. We'll just keep you informed. Um, and then I think that about sums it up on Blossom's end. So I'll let um, Latitude take it from here. Hey, thank you so much, Lou and Blossom for hosting us today. I'm Debbie Tabak and um, I'm actually a Blossom alumni from 14 years ago now. Um, I'm the parent of three children with food allergies and I'm a co-founder of Latitude Food Allergy Care, a specialized um, clinic in Redwood City. And um, I'm really happy to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ronnie Mascatia. Um, today, Dr. Ronnie is a board certified allergist and immunologist. She specializes in food allergy at Latitude. Um, and uh, Latitude is a partner of UCSF Benioff Children's Physicians. She is also the mom of a kindergartner and a third grader, so <laughs> in, in similar boat to a lot of us. Um, and as Lou mentioned, just you know, during and after um, Dr. Ronnie's talk, there'll be um, an opportunity to type in questions to the Q and A. It looks like someone might have already already thrown a question in there. Um, I will uh, actually, Dr. Ronnie will be able to address non-patient specific medical questions um, during the Q and A session. And um, myself and my other colleague, Julie Bittler, um, who you can also see on this screen, uh, Julie is also a parent of two children with food allergies and also a co-founder at Lab. Um, during the Q&A session, Julie and I will both be also available to, and happy to field non-medical food allergy questions. Um, we both wear hats as patient care coordinators at Latitude, so, and we um, collectively have uh, five food allergic children between us, so <laughs> we can answer lots of questions there. Um, and uh, at the end, we'll also share all of our contact information, so if people have questions afterwards, um, and you know, certainly Dr. Ronnie is available to you know um, for telemedicine and in-person appointments coming soon. So um, yeah, so Ronnie, you want to take it away? Sure, thank you, Debbie, for that introduction. So as she mentioned, I'm going to go through um, a presentation. Uh, hopefully that will address some of the questions that you may have. But if it doesn't, then we will have a portion at the end, which is uh, a Q&A. So I can address any non-specific issues. Of course, I can't answer any patient-specific questions in this type of forum, um, but I'm happy to address more general questions. So I am just going to share my screen. All right, and 
We'll get started here. So basically my talk today is just going to be an update on food allergies. We're gonna go over um, a lot of different aspects of food allergies and hopefully this will address um, a lot of the questions that you might have. So to start with, I always like to um, start by just discussing the impact of food allergies because um, it's pretty striking. So current estimates suggest that about one in 13 children has a food allergy. That translates into about two in every classroom. Um, so of course, this is a very big issue, but food allergies weren't always this common. It really does seem like the prevalence has increased more recently. So according to the CDC, the prevalence of food allergy in children increased by about 50% between 1997 and 2011. And in that time, the prevalence of nut allergies actually tripled in U.S. children. There's a lot of ideas about why that may have happened, and we'll discuss a little bit about that later in the talk. Um, even though we associate food allergies mainly with children, important to remember that this does affect adults as well. Over 10% of adults also have food allergies. And of course, as the kids with food allergies get older, this is going to become more of an issue. And the financial um, impact of food allergies is just staggering. The cost of food allergies is estimated to be about $25 billion a year alone uh, in the U.S. And that takes into account things like ER visits and rescue medications and lost work productivity. Of course, we all know that food allergies can have a big emotional impact. So there's many, many studies that detail the negative effects of food allergy on quality of life. In fact, there was one study that showed that adolescents with food allergies actually have worse quality of life than adolescents with type 1 diabetes. So this is a big, big deal um, in this field. And anxiety and stress in people with food allergies happens for many reasons. These kids can feel different. Um, they constantly have to worry about food, which is everywhere. It can affect social activity. Activities, so they may not be able to go to um, restaurants or birthday parties or sleepovers the way that a child without food allergies may be able to. Um, so it can definitely have an effect um, on social activities. And unfortunately, these kids also do tend to suffer higher rates of bullying. So this is just a very basic introduction to food allergies. Now, remember, of course, you know, hundreds of foods can cause food allergies, but it turns out that about 90% of food allergies are caused by eight foods alone. And I have listed them here. Um, so basically peanuts, tree nuts, milk, eggs, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish. About 23% of food allergies are due to um, peanuts, and then 30% of patients are actually allergic to more than one food. And it's always important to remember how serious food allergies are. Up to 40% of kids with food allergies have suffered a life-threatening reaction at some point. So when it comes to potential causes of food allergies, this is still an area that needs a lot of research. We have some idea about what um, might be causing these increased rates of food allergies, but we still need a lot more studies. So one of the things that we do know is a risk factor for food allergies is eczema. So eczema is that red, itchy, flaky rash that can happen um, in kids. And the thought process here is that if a child is exposed to a food for the first time through their skin, through breaks in their skin as occurs in eczema, then that might be more sensitizing and lead to food allergies versus if their first exposure is through the gut, that tends to be more tolerizing or protective against food allergies. And along these same lines, we know that an increased diversity of foods early in life, before 12 months of age, does seem to offer some protection against food allergies. And we'll go into the data behind that a little bit later in the talk. But of course, there's a lot of other hypotheses that you've likely heard about as well. So one of the most famous ones is this hygiene hypothesis. So the idea is that maybe the environment that we've created is too clean. We're not getting enough exposure to microbial factors and bacteria. And so the immune system maybe is getting confused and starting to think of benign things like food or cat or dust as being um, a problem when in fact they're not. Um, so this is a, a hypothesis. It has some studies supporting it. It has a lot of other studies refuting it and so not really clear. Um, but this is uh, definitely something that uh, you may hear about in terms of um, 
risk of allergies. Vitamin D is another thing that's been looked at. So um, a lot of studies previously showed vitamin D deficiency to be associated with allergies, but more recent studies have also been conflicting in this area with higher levels of vitamin Ds um, at times being uh, at conferring a greater risk of developing allergies. We know that environmental factors are also very important. So um, having pets or having older siblings or you know, living on a farm are all examples of environmental factors that seem to be protective against allergies. Um, but of course, um, it's not black and white. And then there's a lot of research going on right now in the microbiome, which is the bacterial composition of the gut and how that may relate to um, allergy risk. So this is a very important slide that I did want to spend some time on. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what exactly food allergies are. So food allergies and food intolerance are two very different things. Food allergies are what I'm going to focus on in this talk. They involve the immune system. They can be life-threatening. They involve a type of antibody, which is called IgE. This antibody in the blood interacts with allergy cells and releases is all sorts of you know, chemical mediators that can cause symptoms like hives or swelling or breathing problems when a person is exposed to their allergen. Food intolerance, on the other hand, is a completely different issue. It's not life-threatening. It doesn't involve the immune system. These symptoms can be very uncomfortable, but in general, this is a much less serious um, issue than food allergies, and it's often limited to digestive problems, though some people report you know, fatigue or brain fog as other um, examples of system, uh, symptoms associated with food intolerance. Um, some examples of food intolerance include lactose intolerance or IBS. Um, but again, this is a completely different issue than food allergies. So in terms of diagnosis, food allergies are actually notoriously difficult to diagnose. We do have allergy testing. However, unfortunately, our current allergy testing is not very specific. What that means is that we get a lot of false positives. And false positives are when the test comes back positive, but it turns out you actually don't have the disease. So because of this high rate of false positive, we know that positive tests alone do not diagnose food allergies. You need a convincing clinical history plus evidence of those IgE antibodies. And we look for IgE antibodies in two ways. You can do a skin test, which is what the picture here is showing, or you can do a blood test. And both of them have their merits. Um, I usually like to have both pieces of information in order to make an accurate diagnosis. And if the history is unclear, let's say someone has a positive test, but they are, they've been eating that food just fine, or they have never eaten that food, in cases like that, you really might need um, a referral to an allergist. Um, and when the history is unclear, we will sometimes perform an oral food challenge in our office. Um, and this is really the gold standard to diagnose food allergy. Again, we would only do this if we suspect there is not a food allergy present, but we basically give the person the food while we monitor them in our clinic in order to definitively say one way or the other whether a food allergy is present. I did want to spend a little bit of time teaching you how to recognize an allergic reaction because honestly every parent should know how to recognize an allergic reaction. Um, I like this particular um, chart because it breaks it down into organ systems, and that's kind of how I think about allergic reactions. So starting with skin issues, um, you can have hives, swelling, itchiness, warmth, redness. The hives and swelling are really the ones that are uh, more specific to um, allergic reactions. You can have respiratory issues involving the lungs, which cause coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, that type of thing. Um, you can have circulatory symptoms, which involve the heart. Um, this causes problems with circulation, so uh, results in dizziness or lightheadedness, um, fainting, even loss of consciousness. And you can have GI symptoms, which involve nausea, diarrhea, stomach cramps, um, vomiting. And then there's also neurologic symptoms that can go along with, with an allergic reaction, um, a feelings of severe anxiety or a severe headache or um, a sense that something just terrible, the worst thing ever is going on. We call this the feeling of impending doom. These are also um, potential symptoms of an allergic reaction. Now, of course, Children might use much different terminology than we do as doctors or as adults. Um, so I wanted to give some examples of a way that a child might describe a reaction. They may say, my tongue itches, 
where it feels hot or burning or tingling. My tongue feels like there's hair on it or it feels full or funny. Um, instead of saying that their throat is swelling, they might say it feels like something stuck in my throat or there's a frog in my throat. I had one child tell me that it felt like there was a banana in their throat. Um, instead of saying their lips are swelling, they'll say my lips feel tight. Instead of saying their ears itch, they might say it feels like there's bugs in their ears. So if your kid does have allergies, um, it's really important for you to also be able to recognize not just mild reactions, but severe reactions. So I wanted to spend some time reviewing anaphylaxis and how to recognize it. Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction that requires the use of an injectable medicine called epinephrine. And the way that anaphylaxis is normally defined is two organ systems. So like we just talked about on that previous slide, um, um, if uh, a child has hives, which would be a skin sy symptom, and also has vomiting, which would be a GI symptom, that's technically two systems, and that would be an indication for epinephrine. Now, of course, you don't need to wait for two organ systems. Systems, um, to happen. If you're having life-threatening symptoms in just one organ system, that's enough. So if a child is having severe shortness of breath or looks like they might be um, passing out after exposure to an allergen or feeling like their throat's closing, you don't need to wait for a second organ system to become involved before treating. In that case, you would give the epinephrine and treat immediately. So let's talk a little bit more about treatment for anaphylaxis. As I mentioned, epinephrine is the medicine that's used to treat anaphylaxis. It is the first line treatment for anaphylaxis. A lot of different things happen in the body when anaphylaxis is occurring. One of them is that the blood vessels get dilated and become leaky. That can lead to drops in blood pressure. So epinephrine helps to kind of tighten up those blood vessels. You also can get tightening in the airways and epinephrine in, in the lungs actually relaxes the smooth muscle and opens up the airways. So it's a very, very effective treatment um, for anaphylaxis. It's actually a very safe treatment as well, especially in kids that don't have any other medical issues. But people are often scared. Parents are often scared to use it. Honestly, a lot of doctors even are scared to use it at times. So it's often underutilized. Um, but I want to be clear that you should not be concerned about using epinephrine in the case of a severe reaction. It absolutely should be the first treatment. And remember that up to 30% of people with anaphylaxis might actually need more than one dose. So I always recommend that you have two auto injectors available. If epinephrine is ever prescribed to you, the package that it comes in should have two two auto injectors included. And then antihistamines like Benadryl or Zyrtec or Claritin, those are also important in treating um, allergic reactions, but there are always second line treatment for anaphylaxis. These medicines are slow to act. They don't really do much for respiratory or circulatory symptoms, but they're very, very good for skin symptoms and for swelling. If you do use an antihistamine, I always um, ask that you consider the longer acting newer versions like cetirizine or Zyrtec instead of diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Benadryl was very commonly used because we always thought that it worked much faster than Zyrtec in an allergic reaction, um, but they have been compared head to head and they work just about the same. Their onset of action is just about the same. Zyrtec, uh, in addition, has the benefit of having less side effects and also lasting longer. So that is the one that I normally recommend. And I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on this table on the, um, on the right side uh, of the slide, uh, just going over some epinephrine myths and facts. So you absolutely do not need to wait until um, you know, a kid is ready to pass out or, or struggling to breathe before using epi. You actually do want to go ahead and give it um, earlier uh, in that uh, reaction. You do not need to remove clothes to use epinephrine. It's designed to go through pretty thick clothing, so you can actually use it through jeans. Epinephrine is always injected onto the outer part of the thigh as is shown in that um, particular diagram. And then remember that epinephrine works really well. So if you give a child epinephrine, they may feel much, much better very quickly. That does not mean you're done, okay? That child had a life-threatening reaction. If you use epinephrine, you absolutely need to seek medical attention in that case um, to make sure that um, everything has resolved properly and that there's no rebound of the anaphylaxis. 
So let's talk a little bit about um, the progression of specific food allergies. So the good news is a lot of food allergies actually can be outgrown in childhood. It's less so than we previously thought, but still the majority of kids with milk, egg, soy, and wheat allergies will actually outgrow those allergies um, on their own. Nuts and seafood are in a different category. However, unfortunately, only about 20% of people with peanut allergies outgrow it, and the rates are even lower for nut allergy. About 15 to 16% of kids outgrow tree nuts, um, and only about 4 to 5% will outgrow fish and shellfish allergies. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about prevention strategies because the good news is there are actually things you can do to try to prevent food allergies um, in your children. So this was a while ago now. You may not be as familiar with these guidelines, but previous guidelines many years ago actually recommended that all kids avoid all allergenic foods in the early years. Now, unfortunately, we know that that probably was the exact wrong advice. Um, we've done a 180. We know that now we have a lot of evidence to suggest that early introduction of certain foods may actually decrease the risk of developing an allergy to that food. And the best data in this area comes from Dr. Lack. He was a researcher and he made the observation that kids in Israel had much lower rates of peanut allergy as compared to Jewish kids in the US or the um, UK. Um, and genetically, these groups were very similar. So he wondered what else could be going on. And one big difference between those two groups of infants is that in Israel, a lot of parents would give their infants this snack called Bamba. It's a peanut snack. And he wondered, is it really the Bamba that might be making a difference in these peanut allergy rates? So he designed this beautiful study. It was over 500 infants. It included um, kids that were actually at a higher risk of developing peanut allergy. So they had either moderate to severe eczema or they had an egg allergy. They were about between four and 11 months of age, and he separated them into two groups. One group strictly avoided peanut, the other group ate peanut early and often, and that study was about three times a week. And it turns out that the kids that were given the peanut early and often ended up decreasing their risk of developing a peanut allergy by 81%. So this was huge. This was so compelling. This study was so well designed that guidelines changed pretty quickly after this study was published. Um, and now no, none of the um, societies recommend avoidance of allergenic foods um, anymore in the early years. So the point then is that you really need to think about introducing these allergenic foods into your child's diet early on to hopefully prevent food allergies from forming. Now, of course, I always will, this is a slide to show you how to um, think about doing that. Now, of course, you first always need to talk to your doctor, especially for higher risk infants, okay? Those are the infants with the more significant eczema or kids that already have a food allergy. You need to be careful. You might even need to see an allergist before you introduce that um, allergen foods for some testing to make sure that it's safe. You never want an allergenic food to be the first food that your baby has, so you want to wait until they've tolerated a few solid foods before giving an allergenic food. You never want to give an allergenic food for the first time at a restaurant. Ideally, you want to do this at home where they can be monitored, preferably early in the day. You don't want to give it and then put them down for you know, the night. Um, and so ideally, you would do it in the home. And I actually do recommend that all parents keep some children's antihistamines in the house. I keep children's Zyrtec in my own house. Um, this is because just like you have children's Tylenol for those times where a kid might have a fever, many, many kids end up having hives. Um, a, some kids do have food allergic reactions, but you know a lot of kids just have more general hives and Zyrtec can be helpful in that situation. So it's just something I recommend keeping in the house, um, especially as, as your kids are learning to um, eat new foods. So some ways to introduce allergenic foods, you could mix some cooked egg into pureed foods. You could try to give them those Bamba snacks if they're a little bit older and able to um, sit up properly. Those are actually found on Amazon and I believe even at Trader Joe's. Um, or you could give some thinned nut butters. Remember, you can never give just straight up nut butters to a child. It's a choking hazard. So you do need to thin them out with water or pureed foods or breast milk. Um, and then of course, um, as you all probably know, you cannot give whole nuts either to children because of that choking risk. So is there anything else that you can do besides early introduction um, to help prevent food allergies? So unfortunately at this time, it doesn't look like we have any 
other strong evidence-based recommendations that we can make. Um, studies have looked at a lot of different things. So current guidelines do not recommend that mothers restrict their diet in pregnancy or nursing as a method of preventing food allergies. It hasn't been shown to help. Um, we've looked at probiotics. Unfortunately, the guidelines don't recommend that either since those also have not been shown to um, be effective in the larger um, design studies. And then there's no evidence right now to support vitamin D supplementation either. Those studies are still ongoing, but so far no good evidence. And then there was some very exciting um, research going on on topical emollients. So these are like greasy heavy ointments like Vaseline or Aquaphor and seeing if we slathered newborns in these ointments, could we prevent eczema and thereby prevent food allergies? And the initial studies were very promising um, and looked great, but when they've done these studies in, in large you know, better design studies, um, it hasn't been as promising. So as of right now, unfortunately, no additional um, recommendations that I can make um, to help prevent food allergies um, in children. So what happens if your child already has food allergies? So as you all know, unfortunately, there's no cure available yet for food allergies. However, the good news is that treatment options do exist. So most of these treatment options revolve around this idea of immunotherapy or desensitization. What this entails is actually exposing people to tiny amounts of their allergen and then gradually increasing the amount of that allergen over time in order to build tolerance. Through this process, we're hoping to teach the body to no longer react to the thing that it's allergic to. And several different forms of immunotherapy exist for food allergies. So the one that has the most data behind it and is the best studied is oral immunotherapy. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. But there are other options also. So sublingual immunotherapy takes the food protein and dissolves it in a liquid and administers it under the tongue. This also has been shown to offer desensitization. It's not as robust as oral immunotherapy. Um, and it's not as well studied as oral immunotherapy, though that is changed. There are more and more um, studies coming out about the effects of sublingual immunotherapy. And there's also epicutaneous immunotherapy. So you may have heard of the peanut patch. Um, that is the idea of epicutaneous immunotherapy. Basically, the peanut protein or whatever food allergy protein is put on a patch that's then a put on the skin. Um, this also, of course, does not lead to as robust of a desensitization as oral immunotherapy would. Um, however, it um, is is an option because, or it, it is not currently approved. We hope that it's approved within the next year or two. Um, it is a much slower process and it won't give the degree of desensitization that oral immunotherapy does, but it is a little bit easier to implement um, and it is also safer. And so this might be um, another option uh, coming out hopefully within the next year or two. So my last slide here is going to focus on oral immunotherapy, which is something that we offer at our clinic, um, Latitude. So what we do with oral immunotherapy is we use the actual food that the kids or adults are allergic to. So basically those food allergens are given in tiny little amounts at first, it looks like dust, it's such a small amount. And then gradually over the course of many months, we slowly increase the amount of that allergen until a maintenance dose is reached. That usually ends up being the equivalent of about one nut. So one peanut, for example, if we're doing peanut oral immunotherapy. And then afterwards that nut needs to be ingested on a regular basis long term because remember we're not curing the allergy we're just treating it with this process so in order to maintain that protection you need to to continue ingesting it on a regular basis. This process has been done in thousands of um, patients, both in clinical trials and in clinical practice. It's been found to be about 80 to 85% effective. Many foods can be treated with oral immunotherapy, including multiple foods at once, and the process can be started in kids as young as 12 months of age. The benefits of oral immunotherapy include protecting against accidental exposure. So if a child is eating a peanut a day as part of their oral immunotherapy regimen, if they accidentally were to eat a peanut, they would be protected. And the, uh, it does also improve quality of life because you have that protection against those accidental exposures. But of course, as with anything we do in medicine, there's gonna be benefits and there's going to be 
risks. So what are the risks of immunotherapy? Well, we're giving the child something that they're allergic to. So there is a risk of having an allergic reaction to the actual dose. The vast majority of these reactions are mild. They mainly involve the GI tract and cause some stomach pains and things like that. Um, but in rare cases, you can have more significant reactions, including anaphylaxis. So at all times, epinephrine has to be carried. That does not change because you underwent oral immunotherapy. You still need to carry EpiPens just in case. And for anyone that's going through oral immunotherapy, we give you a lot of tips, tricks, and you know, uh, recommendations to try to decrease that risk of allergic reaction. And then there is another condition. Um, it's a fancy word, eosinophilic esophagitis, um, but basically it means inflammation around the esophagus or the food pipe. And this condition happens in about 5% of people undergoing oral immunotherapy. Uh, it can cause pain in the chest. It can cause vomiting. Uh, it can even cause trouble swallowing long term if it's not um, addressed. Um, and so this is another thing that we do watch for um, when patients undergo oral immunotherapy. So just to recap, as we discussed, um, our allergy testing uh, is not where it needs to be, and so we do have a lot of false positives. So positive tests alone do not mean that someone has a food allergy. If there's any concern or question, please see a board-certified allergist for proper diagnosis and even an oral food challenge if indicated. As we talked about, um, early introduction of allergenic foods is now recommended to help prevent food allergies. Of course, a lot of progress still needs to be made. We need better um, and more prevention strategies besides just early introduction. We need better diagnostic tests that don't have such high false positive rates. We need increased treatment options, and hopefully we will have a cure one day as well. Um, but the good news is that treatment options like oral immunotherapy are available now. All right, and so that is it. We just wanted to thank Blossom Birth and Family um, for putting together this webinar. We really do appreciate it. And um, of course, uh, if you could consider supporting this nonprofit, that would be much appreciated. Um, I also do have uh, contact information for our clinic, uh, which is located in Redwood City. And so at this time, I will go ahead um, should I stop sharing my screen, Lou, or should I just continue? Why don't you go ahead, it's Debbie, you can um, go okay. ahead and leave that up there for a couple okay. of minutes. I also threw um, the contact information for, um, for Dr. Ronnie and myself and for Julie um, in, the, in the chat for everybody to see and, and copy. Um, and if anyone would like to um, you know, type in some questions, it does look like we already do have one question. Thank you so much, Ronnie, for that great talk. And I think um, this first question um, wasn't quite addressed and maybe it'll, it'll be a part Dr. Ronnie and part Julie answer. <laughs> um, so uh, one mom has asked um, about one of her six-year-old um, twins has multiple food allergies. He's um, still very reluctant at six years old to try new foods. And um, if you have suggestions for, for a stubborn child, but um, maybe Dr. Ronnie, you can address that from the medical side. And Julie, um, perhaps you can address that from the um, non-medical side. Sure. So, you know, in any child that has uh, multiple food allergies, the first thing that I always do recommend um, is that the uh, diagnosis um, be certain. So I, I will tell you that I do see kids day in, day out that come in with a whole host of, of food allergies, but it turns out that there, although, you know, a few of them or even a lot of them end up being true food allergies, a lot of times it doesn't end up being the entire list. And that can be really life-changing you know, for a family if they think that they have allergies to all tree nuts, um, which include things like cashews and walnuts and almonds, because they have a peanut allergy, then you know, if you can give them the opportunity to bring tree nuts back into their diet, that can be really, really life-changing. So I do always recommend um, that you make sure that you know, all of the multiple food allergies have been properly diagnosed. And then after that, you know, if 
it's ever helpful. I do offer even food challenges in my clinics in these cases where a kid just might be too terrified to do it at home. So knowing that it's being done, you know, under the supervision of a doctor, that sometimes can be helpful. Um, and so that is something that, you know, we will sometimes do because our goal is to help expand these kids' diets in every way. Like we talked about, you know, that is that is a big deal, eating and, and having, you know, a, a good variety in the diet. That is is so important for quality of life. Um, and so I, I would, you know, uh, encourage you to, to seek the guidance of your allergist to make sure that you have the proper diagnosis that he really needs to be avoiding every single food on that list. Um, and then if there is still a lot of anxiety, perhaps, you know, you can um, consider doing some in-office food challenges if you think that that would be helpful um, for your child. And then I'll let Julie take over from here also. Thank you, Ronnie. I agree with Ronnie. I think a lot of what goes on with food allergic children and anxiety around food is the big worry that if they eat something, what could happen to them and the reaction and what that might look like. They've already maybe gone through a very scary allergic reaction. And so the thought of trying new foods might just be more than they want to think about while they're eating. And of course, some children are just picky eaters and that happens regardless of whether you have a food allergy or not. So my thought as a fellow food allergy parent would be for sure to sort of follow up with the idea that Ronnie was talking about, making sure that the child is really diagnosed so that you know fully, okay, are these foods that you're avoiding maybe a few of them might be something that might be safe for the child to eat. So once you get a full idea of exactly what those foods are, and it may be that the child is avoiding all of the foods that they truly are allergic to, but then it might be a way of trying to help get creative with some foods. Maybe they're just picky and, you know, maybe they don't like cauliflower, but you feel like you want to get a vegetable in there. Well, maybe you can make a cauliflower look like a mashed potato, you know, so just trying to get creative with the foods that they can eat and try to really understand the anxiety that is possibly going along with it. So really maybe try to have that conversation. I understand the child is six, but at all ages, maybe trying to get an idea if a child is really picky and figuring out is it so much that they don't like the texture or the food or the taste or is there an anxiety around the food allergy and so that is where if there is some anxiety around what could happen if they eat a food that could be something that would be helpful as ronnie was saying maybe even having some of those foods introduced in a doctor's office so i hope those suggestions help thank you julie and dr ronnie um, we have a couple other questions um, that, that may sort of overlap. Someone um, specifically asked about how f -pies is diagnosed and um, is it outgrown with time? And another person um, actually had a sort of multi-tiered question um, about multiple types of symptoms, but it looks like that um, that child may have also had F pies um, or something similar. So Ronnie, if you could address what F pies is and how that fits in with food allergies. Sure, so F pies is really in a different category than IgE mediated food allergies. It's often referred to as an allergy, um, but it's more an inflammatory type of process. So it stands for food protein induced enterocolitis. And this is a condition that actually does not involve IgE, that allergy antibody that we um, discussed earlier in the talk. Um, and it's actually a, quite a different process. It usually is a GI process and it presents with delay delayed vomiting, um, and it can even be so severe that it leads to low blood pressure, um, but it's, it's a different type of process than IgE-mediated food allergies. Um, and it can be, a, a, honestly, quite a scary thing to, to see because those blood pressures can drop, and so this is um, something that we take very seriously. It's much, much, much less common than food allergies are. Um, however, I do see it um, in practice. And and the good news about f -pies is that the vast majority do end up resolving on their own. You cannot use anything like 
for example, oral immunotherapy with FPIs. The only treatment for FPIs is to strictly avoid any of the foods that might be causing it um, and to just wait to see if the child outgrows. This is a condition that's often managed um, by pediatric GI doctors. Um, some allergists do also um, help with it. But again, since it's not that classic IgE-mediated process, there's unfortunately not much that, that really can be done for FPIs outside of just waiting for the body to you know, just resolve it on its own. Um, and I'm sorry, Debbie, what was the second part of that question? Um, well, so there was, there was a general question about FPIs, and then yeah. there was a question posed um, by a parent of an eight-year-old who struggles with migraines, will often vomit once or twice while having a horrible headache and complaining of a stomach ache, um, and it looks like um, kind of a history of a lot of GI distress with food. Mm -hmm. So there was this question of um, whether that could be a food allergy. Um, right. So, yeah, kind of, um, you know, going back a little bit. So there are many different types of adverse reactions to foods. Um, but what we really look for to diagnose a true food allergy is number one, having that IgE antibody. Um, without that, you know, it, it's not going to be a food allergy. Um, and then also, Remember that with food allergies, the vast majority of them, 90% or more of food allergic reactions do involve the skin. So it would be much less likely for a food allergy to be causing isolated vomiting. It can happen, um, but you know that would not be the common type of situation. And if there is any question about it, of course, some testing can be done to, to clarify the issue. But with the food allergy, remember, it's not just, oh, any food causes me to have a migraine and my tummy hurts. You can't be allergic to everything out there. It really needs to be very specific. You eat the food, you have the symptoms. You don't eat the food, you don't have the symptoms. That's really how we try to determine whether this is a true food allergy or if it falls into that category of adverse food reactions and food intolerances or food um, sensitivities. So I don't want to give any specific medical advice for any specific um, situation, but in general, that's kind of how you can look at it. With a food allergy, when you eat the food, you'll have the symptoms. If you take that food out, you shouldn't have um, the symptoms. And with a food allergy, you need to have that IgE and you need to have those classic um, allergic symptoms. So, you know, the migraine by itself definitely would not be something that I would consider um, a classic um, you know, symptom for, for an allergic reaction. Right. And then um, someone else ha had a question, and I think you, you started to touch a little bit on this about the, um, about eczema. Um, um, a parent asked that um, they've just started introducing foods to their eight month old. Um, and since starting the solids, one pureed food at a time, the only, um, the reaction that they're seeing is facial eczema. And um, it has gotten pretty bad. And how, how should they proceed with that? Yeah, so this is a very common um, question that I encounter. And so eczema, is an inflammatory skin disease that tends to ebb and flow. So it does get worse at times, it gets better at times. And a lot of parents will notice that when they start to give their kids solid foods, they'll notice a worsening of the eczema. So does that mean that the kid has a food allergy um, or does it mean something else? And what I'll say is that there is a whole category of foods um, that can cause something called food exacerbated eczema. That is different than an IgE mediated food allergy. So IgE mediated food allergies, the skin symptoms that they tend to cause are those hives, which are these red raised bumps. They tend to last just for 24 hours um, or much less if you give an antihistamine. Eczema on the other hand tends to persist for days, even weeks. Um, and so they're different skin manifestations. The hives are the ones that are quite concerning for an IgE mediated food allergy. Eczema flares are unfortunately quite common and can happen with, with you know, several different types of foods. And in food exacerbated 
eczema, you should work with either a dermatologist or an allergist to help get better treatment of the eczema. But I actually don't usually recommend avoiding foods simply for food exacerbated eczema. And the reason why is that we do have studies showing that if you take out the foods that are causing the eczema from the child's diet, when you eventually try to reintroduce that food, you may have put them at risk of having an IgE-mediated anaphylactic type of reaction. And so for that reason, I encourage you to, if it's just eczema and it's not hives and it's not obviously breathing issues or anything else, if it's just eczema, I actually encourage you to work possibly with a dermatologist to be more aggressive with the topical treatments for that eczema because we want to get that eczema under control, but we don't want to do that by eliminating a bunch of foods from the child's diet. Um, Ronnie, along the same lines, another parent just asked um, that introducing new foods to their baby, they sometimes get red spots only on the face but not on the body that go away within an hour. Is that an allergy or a contact? Is that more likely a contact reaction? And yeah, that, I mean, that's hard to answer, um, you know, without, you know, seeing photos and, and getting a bit more detailed history. So I would encourage you maybe to talk to your um, doctor uh, about that to see if they think that an allergist referral um, might be indicated. Uh, it's very tough to make those kinds of calls just, you know, with a, a general description like that. I'd need a lot more information about which foods, you know, is it just one food? Um, you know, what does it actually look like? There's a lot more that, that needs to be um, determined before we can safely say, oh yeah, that's no problem or, or that's definitely um, an issue. Um, so I do encourage you to talk to your doctor about that um, because, you know, red spots on, on the face that are lasting for an hour, I, I don't know what that is, but um, could it potentially be associated with an allergy? It could. And so you should have um, a doctor do a little bit more detailed history and and you know potentially show some pictures and things of what you're talking about um, in order to get a better diagnosis yeah and I would just pipe in that um, right now I know that a lot of families are very you know hesitant to um, to call the doctor to go into the doctor a lot of pediatricians and I know our office are offering um, telemedicine appointments um, to you know, new and existing patients to really limit the, the types of in-office appointments. But also, if you were to, you know, if your child was to have a reaction, don't hesitate to seek that medical care that you need right now. Um, it looks like we have another question, um, and this one's actually adult directed. So. Um, mm -hmm my, and, and a little bit of a prevention. Um, <laughs> let's see, my husband and I both have multiple food allergies and intolerances, and I don't eat a lot of allergenic food, um, so they're not in our house or our diet. We're expecting a baby in a few weeks. Will it be an issue if we aren't introducing these foods um, once she can eat solids, and is she at higher risk of allergies? Um, to these foods given that they won't be present at all in my breast milk? A few questions. Well, that, yeah, that, it's, it's a good question. Um, and so, you know, with all children, the recommendation is that you try to give these allergenic foods um, and keep them in their diets. We do have evidence to suggest that if they are not getting exposed at all to these allergenic foods, um, you know, earlier in life, that they may be at a higher risk, especially if that child ends up having um, moderate to severe eczema or anything like that, then and unfortunately, that, that's just what the data shows, is that if you completely um, keep those foods out of that child's diet, they may develop anaphylactic food allergies to those particular foods. So I know that this is a, a, a hard situation. We run into the same type of issue when one kid has a food allergy and then there's a newborn in the house and you got to, you know, introduce those foods into the newborn's diet, but keep them away from the kid that has the food allergies. Um, and so these are things that, um, you know, we, we do um, have to uh, think about and, and questions like this do come up, um, but I would encourage you to find ways to, to get those allergenic foods into um, the child's diet, um, because as of right now, that's the only way that we know of to hopefully prevent food allergies um, from forming. Um 
I'm just going to pipe in with one other thing um, is we, so in our practice, um, Dr. Ronnie treats adults and, um, and obviously babies starting as young as four months. Um, and what we very often find with adults food allergy patients is that they may have, it may have been many, many years since they last saw a, an allergist to check in on those allergies. Um, so we would just encourage you, particularly when you have a very, very long list of foods that you're avoiding um, to just have a check-in and see where you and or your husband are with your allergies because there could potentially be if you know if in past years you were told to avoid all tree nuts but perhaps you're not actually allergic to all tree nuts and there are a few things that you could incorporate into into your home um, to, to just ease that that pressure a little bit. Are there other questions? We don't have anything else queued up. These have been great, thank you. Okay, it looks like we have um, one, another question about a one-year-old um, has eczema and we did a blood test at six months for food allergies. We have avoided all the foods where the IgE um, was over uh, one KU, I, I'm not sure how to read that, but where the IgE was over one. Right. Um, do we continue to avoid these foods until we see a blood test with low IgE levels? So that's a great question and one that I see again and again, and I think a lot of allergists see again and again. Um, as we talked about, the rate of false positives with our allergy testing is quite high. I'm talking like 50, 60% in some cases. Um, and kids with eczema are the ones that in particular are more likely to have elevated IgE levels. And so I strongly encourage you, if you haven't already, to get a referral to an allergist who can look over these positive tests and determine which ones may actually be more likely to be false positives versus true positives. They may want to do a skin test um, as well. Um, and so I, I strongly encourage you to, to get um, an evaluation by an allergist. Um, so it's because it's not black and white. It's not, oh, the test was positive, so you have an allergy to it. It doesn't work like that. Um, and so that would be my recommendation is, is just to hopefully get it evaluated in a little bit more detail so that you have a better idea of what foods might actually be a true through allergy and which ones are um, false positives. Great, okay. Um, and then there's a question about, um, do you see any evidence that organic, I'm assuming organic food versus non-organic food has any impact on, um, I assume the question really is, you know, on reactions or rates of food allergy? Um, so uh, I honestly, I haven't seen any compelling evidence um, to suggest that. Um, I'm sure that, you know, there are probably studies ongoing, but has anything come out that's, that's very evidence-based to suggest that organic is, is better than, you know, not organic? I, I haven't really seen that, no. Great. Okay, any other questions before we wrap up? Give it, a, give it a second <laughs> in case someone's <laughs> typing. <laughs> Ronnie, thank you so much. Sure, sure. Yeah, and and we included all of our contact information in, um, like I said, in the chat. So, um, you know, if people did have additional questions, I'll pop back on video here to say goodbye. Um, if anybody did have any other, you know, questions, Julie, anything you wanted to, to add? Just really appreciate Blossom Birth for hosting this yeah. wonderfully educated um, topic on food allergies and thank you so much to Dr. Ronnie for your presentation I think was very informative and thank you so much to Lou for you know bringing the community together and I hope that everybody was able to learn something new I know I always love to hear Dr. Ronnie talk and mm -hmm. it's always great to hear the information that's out there so thank you all for joining and Lou don't know if you have any more to to add yeah, I mean, just thanks all around. Thank you to the participants who joined in today and gave us your time. I hope today was informative because it really was for me. 
I was really enthused to be a part of this project. So I'm really happy. If it weren't for viewers like you, um, we wouldn't be able to put on this content. So um, and thank you, Ronnie and, and Debbie sure. and Julie. This was a pleasure working with you guys. Um, and we look forward to hosting mm -hmm. you and some more food related allergy content in the future. Um, for everyone who's listening in, if you guys wanted to learn more about Blossom or more programs that we offer at Blossom, feel welcome to visit our website, um, blossombirthandfamily.org. Um, and then we've added links to our donation page as, as we've mentioned earlier. Um, majority of our income is donation-based. Um, so if you feel generous today, any amount helps. Um, and like I said, we're very grateful to be involved in these types of projects and helping spread the word about some of these issues that are really, really prevalent in families today. So thank you again. Um, you're welcome to excuse yourself from the call. I'm just going to leave everything open for just a little while longer if you wanted to copy and paste from the, the group chat to get um, the panelists' information, if you wanted to um, find that donation page. Now is the time to do it. Um, thank you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> thank, you so much. thank you all for attending. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.